Um, before we do really get started, before I introduce our two fantastic speakers today, um, I have two uh, short um, notices. One is um, a very cheerful one, one which is a not so cheerful one. So I'm going to start um, start with the cheerful, and that is you will all be very pleased to know that it is time to renew or perhaps uh, subscribe for the first time to your British Institute at Ankara memberships. Um, there is going to be a notice on how you can subscribe and become a member of the British Institute at Ankara that will be posted in the chat box. Um, you can also find details for membership on our website as well. Um, we are always uh, keen to have new members. Not only can you join us at occasions like this, which you can join us if you are not a member as well, um, but you also get uh, our magazine and regular newsletters and member only events as well. So please do consider that if you are enjoying this online seminar series. All membership fees go towards uh, supporting the work of the Institute um, and its publications. Um, now, the second of today's notices is a slightly less fun one. Um, some of you may have heard already that um, uh, the very esteemed um, archaeologist Mark Vulcans um, has very sadly passed away, um, I think just yesterday. This is a great loss to us as a community of um, Anatolian archaeologists. This is um, a scholar who has labored for many years in the field and who has brought us um, some very, very important insights. Um, a great man who I think will be sorely missed, but that is just worth us marking together. In the meantime, um, I'm glad that a few more people have joined us. Um, again, we have people from, we've got Brian in Tunbridge Wells, Frankfurt, Ayrshire, Durham, Torino, um, more from Torino, East Grinsid, Zon Guldak. I'm never, I, I've never been there. I'm not even sure where that is. That's fantastic. NYC, Antalya and Ankara, fantastic. From the Netherlands, from Aswan, fantastic. From Toronto, um, Ontario, hi Hugh, hope you well. There's Bella, Demo, hi Bella in Athens. Um, and I'm sorry if I have not said hello to everyone individually. Um, if I haven't said hello to everybody individually, there's quite a few of you um, who have joined us. Hello to China as well. Fantastic. I think that might be a first. So we are definitely, I think, petered out at 116 participants. That is a great showing. I am so happy to have you all here. We've had a short break in this Anatolian Studies virtual seminar series over um, the beginning of the new year, but we are back once again with a bite. It is the first seminar of 2021, but we are still um, working our way through some of the great, great papers that we published in our 2020 volume. Um, and today's paper is no exception. We have uh, Dr. Jane Rempel, who is a lecturer in classical archaeology at the University of Sheffield. You want to say that's, she's here. You can probably see her. There we go. Um, and we also have um, Professor Owen Doonan, um, who is a professor of art. Is that correct? I think I've got that correct. A professor of art. Oh, art, yeah. art history. Yeah, art, art history and archaeology. At California State University. Um, and they will be uh, speaking about their paper, which was published in Anatolian Studies in 2020, um, about the rural hinterlands of the Black Sea. And without further ado, I shall pass you over to them. Jane, are you able to share your screen? No, I'm not, if you would let me. Right, okay, right, this is a problem. Let's try and get <laughs> that back online. Is it is now working? Can you now share your screen? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. I will hand over to you then and look forward to uh, okay. fantastic. I'm hoping that is uh, visible to everyone, our title slide. I saw that Sh Sue Sherat said hello in uh, the chat and just to be pleased that we're showing a picture of her in the field at sent up here in our title slide. All right, there we go. Uh, so thank you very much to, uh, to you, Nisha, and to the BIA for inviting us to speak today, uh, and to the Anatolian Studies team for publishing the paper on which our talk today will be based. 
the original idea for this paper developed well. Owen and I were sitting and looking out at this very Black Sea view in Synap, talking about settlement patterns in survey data, as you do. Um, and while our Anatolian studies paper focused on rural hinterlands of the settlements around the Black Sea, the sea itself is central to our interpretation of the ways in which um, dynamic new investment in agricultural hinterlands was related to regional economic uh, and political networks, and in turn a driver for social transformation in the later classical and early Hellenistic periods. In fact, this trend is not limited to the Black Sea. Uh, in the larger Mediterranean context, this is a period of expansion, not only in the scale of political entities, but also in the engagement between urban, agricultural, and rural communities. The Black Sea is particularly interesting as an arena at the edge of the great political entities of the age. In the first half of our talk, we'll give an overview of the arguments in um, our Anatolian studies paper. In the second half, we'll broaden our scope to consider the Black Sea more generally in the late classical and early Hellenistic periods, and more specifically how recent research on the urban development of ancient Sinope uh, in this period emphasizes an interconnection of city and countryside that is com comparable to other parts of the Black Sea. So the ecological and geographic situation of the Black Sea has been a driver in fostering a shared maricultural and economic sphere for some 4,000 years. The climate and landscape diversity between the north, south, east, and west coasts encourages complementary agricultural regimes uh, with localized wheat, grape, olive production, as well as natural resources, timber, uh, minerals, and so forth. Um, the circulation of the surface currents facilitates transpontic and circumpontic transportation, um, particularly conditioned by uh, seasonal changes. And then uh, the regular migratory patterns of economically significant fish species like bonito or palamut and anchovies or hamsi, uh, these have been exploited by itinerant fisher folk since the Iron Age and quite possibly the early Bronze Age based on finds, uh, recent finds from the Sinopkale excavations. So all of this means we need to look at the Black Sea as a whole in order to understand the impacts of agricultural intensification and resource exploitation uh, along any of its shores. The fourth century BC was a period of prosperity and mobility in the Black Sea. And a key driver in this trade, uh, a key driver in this was trade in agricultural products, especially wine and grain, which circulated around the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean. This agricultural trade required surplus production and increased investment in agricultural territory and rural hinterlands. And this is where our paper starts. Well, the evidence for robust agricultural cores of Greek settlements um, from the fourth century BCE has been clear uh, from the North Coast since the 1950s. In this paper, we took a holistic approach to the Black Sea, including the evidence, the increasing evidence from the West Coast, and particularly including the South Coast and the CNUP Regional Archaeological Project survey data, which had not been discussed in this context before. Our analysis demonstrated an overall patterning that allowed us to nuance the interpretation of not only expansion, but increased investments of, in rural hinterlands of the Greek settlements during this period. And the key themes in this patterning were uh, increase in rural settlement, new agricultural installations, new road and path networks, and expansion into rural hinterlands beyond the Cora. And despite the fact that decisions to expand or intensify rural territory and agricultural production were taken at the local level and there are local drivers for this uh, phenomenon, this patterning overall demonstrates that such developments were also a response to the dynamics of broader Black Sea economic and political networks and had so important social impacts. So this, the first theme that uh, we identified, the increase in site numbers, is perhaps the most clearly and consistently identified through survey data. And although the increased visibility of fourth century ceramic material has no doubt had an impact here, this pattern is consistent in many regions of the Black Sea and has been consistently supported through excavation, especially on the North Coast. 
within this general patterning of increase in rural settlement numbers uh, are increased numbers of settlements within already established koras, like at Obia or Nanfeam, and new sites associated with an expansion of territory in this period, uh, as in the Bosporan Kingdom or the Kersenisen further, further Kora. This pattern um, of uh, increased site numbers holds true for the north and west coast, and survey in the Vani region uh, in the east suggests a similar phenomenon. But although textual sources discuss Heraclea Pontica's expansion in this period, the CNAP Regional Archaeological Project data provides the best set of data for examining trends in rural settlement on the south coast of the Black Sea. So the Sinop Regional Archaeological Project uh, was based on a survey of the hinterland of Sinop uh, from 1996 uh, to 2013. You can see the survey areas highlighted in the slide here, uh, including near, hinter, uh, near the city on the uh, Presque of uh, Boztepe, uh, the uh, and on the hinterland itself in the Akliman Valley, uh, the Demirji and Kirkgechichai Valleys explored the coastal, uh, west coastal and uh, upland um, settlement patterns as well. Um, now, for decades, it was assumed that the Sino uh, promontory was depopulated during the first millennium BCE. Based on our results from the Sino Kale excavations, we now know. Um, based on our revision of local ceramic typologies, that there was widespread settlement at this time. And the indigenous settlements in the hinterland became more visible when they became entangled in exchange networks with colonial partners in the late classical Hellenistic period. And so here on this uh, map, we see uh, a revised uh, sort of distribution of, uh, of Iron Age sites. Uh, you can see running all the way into uh, highland areas, um, much more extensive than was known before. And so we are taking into account this uh, much expanded um, sense of the impact of, uh, of colonization and trade on the, on the you know, hinterland. Uh, Jane? Um, the uh, uh, second theme is uh, increase in agricultural installations. And uh, on a Black Sea level, this increase in rural settlement that we just discussed is often accompanied by evidence for increased investment in agricultural installations, emphasizing the role of agri agricultural production in these rural landscapes. These agricultural installations uh, include uh, farmstead sites, uh, that often are accompanied with evidence for agricultural processing, like wine presses and for storage of agricultural produce, um, uh, like grain storage. And uh, we can also see in this period, large scale reconfigurations of agricultural landscapes with field divisions and irrigation systems, uh, like the regular field divisions within the Koras of Nymphaeon and Kersenesis, um, field divisions imposed on newly expanded rural territories like those in the Tarkanku Peninsula, and more organic field divisions like those proposed by Karyaka at Obia. These rural hinterlands, more dense with settlements and increasingly structured by agricultural installations, increasingly played a role in not only the economic and political structures they were created by, but also structuring social relationships within the hinterlands and relationships between the city and countryside. And we can postulate a similar picture emerging um, at, at Sinope in the same period. Okay, so uh, the Sinope Regional Archaeological Survey conducted systematic surveys on the Boztepe headland, uh, the near hinterland of uh, the city, um, and the coastal and inland areas, as I mentioned before. On Boztepe, uh, which we see here, um, uh, we see supplemented by the results of the Franco-Turkish excavations at Zeytinlik and Karakum in the 1990s, and more recent excavations carried out by Sino Museum, uh, we can see that uh, a documentation of an extensive spread of suburban villas up onto the Oztepe Preskil, so that uh, we can uh, now uh, see 
especially um, un unlike the um, uh, what what we can see in the north, the urban spread of the modern city has obscured the clear pattern and the density of the spread. But uh, the overall pattern is not unlike the Crimean contemporaries. Agricultural villas appear to be spread along the sheltered slopes on the sunny southern exposure of Boztepe. Uh, Amphora potteries were situated on the coast and appear to have served uh, wine production. Now, coincident with these developments in the hinterland, we can observe the founding of new coastal settlements, showing evidence of contact with Sinope and the broader world and the engagement of pre-existing indigenous settlements through the expanding distribution of Sinope amphorae in coastal sites up into river valleys in the hinterland and in sites around the Pontic region. Now, as I mentioned, uh, uh, one uh, important point is that uh, Sinope exports of wine and roof tiles that are probably based on the um, Boztepe production uh, reached a peak in the third century BCE, um, which is visible uh, in particular because of the distinctive pyroxene temper, uh, which is the signature of Sinope wares. Now, Sinope's, Sinope's broader ambitions at this time can also be seen in a treaty with Heraclea, uh, which is um, uh, documented in a uh, an inscription uh, found uh, locally about uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, which stipulates that the two cities would come to one another's aid uh, if any foe but uh, the, the king of Persia attacks. And so both cities, uh, I, I think, are, are in a position where they, they feel they can hold their own against uh, Black Sea rivals. And so uh, I think this, um, this speaks to the uh, the, the, the broader political integration of, um, uh, of Sinope, Heraclea, and, uh, and, and the other Black Sea cities. Jane? That's an excellent example of the local circumstances that um, underlie the uh, patterning uh, at Sinope, but still fit in with this larger uh, Black Sea patterning that we've been uh, talking about. And the third, uh, theme in the patterning is the um, uh, development of new road networks and pathways within these rural hinterlands. These included routes associated with new field systems that often facilitated connections from the fields to the sea, um, uh, small ports, and from the fields to uh, the, and rural settlements to the polis. But they also included new road networks um, that connected uh, the new rural settlements from the period as on the Tanan Peninsula and the continued use of routes of transhumans as in the Tarkankut Peninsula. Again, these features contributed to the increased connect connectivity between rural communities and between city and countryside that we see in this period. Okay. So the near coastal element of the indigenous Iron Age settlement pattern on Sino Promontory is typified by settlements that are less than one hectare in extent. They're tucked back slightly from the coast, set on low ridges that flank the alluvial beaches um, at valley outlets. And so a good example of this is uh, Ilyan and Yeri uh, here uh, near the uh, modern uh, village of Chakarolu. A series of new settlements in similar situations was documented by the survey, all of which show Sinope amphorae, imported black slip ceramics and other wares associated uh, with uh, the uh, broader uh, Hellenistic uh, economy. To some extent, uh, this appears to uh, serve almost as an expanded cora uh, that's discontinuous over land, but connected to the port by sea. These are also points of engagement between indigenous and colonial communities. Thus the Sinope equivalent of the expanding road networks surrounding Northern and Western uh, Pontic cities uh, on the other coasts of the Black Sea appears to have been structured over water. References to the extraordinary quality of Sinope's fish products in Theodorus Siculus and Pliny the Elder most likely pertain 
uh, to a fishing industry that um, reached prominence in the times we're speaking of uh, right now. And this brings us to the final uh, theme of patterning that we uh, we see in these rural hinterlands, and that's the expansion of agricultural and economic activity beyond the Kora, suggesting a development of agricultural communities and larger economies of resource and production that are not as archaeological, archaeologically as visible as some of the agricultural uh, installations that we've seen. So um, linking to, as Owens just suggested, to trade of fish, but also timber, slaves, hides. Um, that were coming from uh, even further hinterlands. These expansions beyond the Kora include not only new, new territory claimed through agricultural cultivation, such as the further Kora of Kersinesis in the Western Crimea, but also new rural settlements outside agricultural field systems and increased evidence for trade and exchange into adjacent territories. Overall, we see a clear pattern of tiered connection to the rural hinterlands around the Greek settlements, with um, most, uh, most closely and intensively settled and often formally organized agricultural territory, or Kora, and then adjacent territories linked to the wider agricultural or economic structure of the hinterland, and perhaps inhabited by dependent populations, um, as has been suggested for the Salisha on the Kerch Peninsula or the upland settlements um, uh, that were found in the Zari Glatch survey project. And then beyond this, there existed a wider sphere of influence where local populations interacted with economic and social networks that were created through the expansion of these robust hinterlands during this period. Now, in the Kirk Getchet Chai Valley, the survey investigated the functioning of networks along a river valley that eventually became the route of a major Roman road uh, over the Pontic Alps. Tingerepe, uh, in the village of Tingerolu, uh, is a major indigenous settled citadel high up in the um, uh, high up in the mountains, and you can see the location uh, here on the Google Earth image. Here is the plan of Tingertepe. And, and so, um, excuse me, I've, I've lost my place. So this may have served as a main settlement along several inter, um, uh, among several that were interspersed along the Kirkkejitchai Valley. Fourth and third century Sinop amphorae and imported fine wares were documented at most of these sites. And you can see the, the range of sites here. Uh, this Highland Valley most likely was engaged in the production of timber for which Sinope was known as early as uh, the writings of uh, Theophrastus, so fourth century. Jane? So we contend that the general trend towards increased investment in rural hinterlands and agricultural production in the fourth century BC was a response to the expansion and intensification of economic and political networks in the Black Sea that included the polis along around the coast as well as neighboring regional policy uh, polities. And although the fourth century um, is often described as a time of fragmentation and even decline, for the Black Sea, it was a period of prosperity, mobility, and competition uh, between the Black Sea polis as well as these regional polities. In addition to the increased investment in and expansion of uh, rural hinterlands, we can see evidence of not only this prosperity, but also competition in uh, other ways as well around the Black Sea. So for example, the investment in either new or newly, um, uh, newly expanded or refurbished fortifications in the fourth and third centuries BC, as you can see uh, indicated here. Um, and although these monumental fortifications were no doubt responses to perceived threats in the various um, regions that they were constructed, they also collectively were effective statements about urban prosperity and prominence within the larger Black Sea region. And part of this uh, statement of urban prosperity and prominence can be seen in some indications of investment in, uh, in urban development or investment of um, uh, the urban uh, landscape 
uh, whether that's uh, developing the Acropolis territory of Pantacapaean uh, in the fourth and third centuries, as you can see here, or the development of the lower city in Olbia um, as a uh, intensively productive area. We can also see evidence of this elite uh, of this prosperity and competition in terms of uh, elite burial practices, monumental burial traditions that um, incorporated monumental size and lavish grave assemblages as signature uh, um, signature elements. Um, the Scythian and Thracian uh, monumental burial mounds are, are an obvious example here, but during um, the fourth century BC, we can also see new uh, monumental or lavish burial traditions that were connected with the Greek polis themselves on the coast um, and often located on the outskirts of the polis themselves, um, as for example, the Tsarski Kurgan uh, near Pantikapaeon or the mounded burials near and Apollonia Pontica. Okay, so in Sinope, the Sinopale excavations, uh, which were carried out uh, uh, initially from 2015 to 2017 uh, by the authors uh, together with uh, several colleagues who are attending today, including, uh, I see Andrew Goldman and uh, Alex Bauer, uh, Sue Sherat and others. Um, uh, we, uh, together with um, extensive rescue excavations, which are interspersed throughout the city of Sinop, carried out by the Sinop Museum. Uh, together, these are permitting a new consideration of the fourth century city, which until now was nearly invisible. Okay. So I'm going to uh, focus on a few different uh, interesting new elements that we can now start to understand a little bit better uh, because of this work. The urban grid plan appears uh, likely to date from this uh, phase uh, and, um, and, and, and there are uh, several monumental elements of the city uh, that, um, uh, that seem to be associated with it as well. Uh, next slide, please. Most significantly, uh, the fortification wall, which now we can redate to the early third century BCE, redefining the relationship between the city and its suburban hinterland on, uh, on Sinop Promontory. In addition, uh, Sinop Museum Director Hussein Rural has recently discovered a, um, uh, a corner of a Hellenistic tower in the east wall of the city. So, our main excavations are over here, the curtain wall, uh, the, the well-known you know, uh, uh, promontory on the, on the defining the western edge of the urban space. Uh, on the eastern edge, uh, you might be able to make out a, um, uh, a red dot there uh, marked Hellenistic tower. Uh, this is the location of the new uh, Hellenistic tower discovered by uh, uh, museum director uh, Hussein Varal. Uh, and so these confirm that a monumental, um, a monumental fortification defined the southeast uh, entrance into the city as well. Now, the rediscovery of the tower from the east wall, and uh, next slide, please, and harbor facilities um, that were also uh, uncovered in Sino you know, Museum excavations. These harbor facilities are almost 100 meters north of uh, the present coast uh, of the city. Um, and uh, these have prompted our thinking uh, that the harbor system was far more complex than earlier believed. Uh, it now appears that a small harbor at the southeast flank of the town was redefined as a military harbor, and then a more extensive uh, 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 open commercial harbor uh, may have occupied the space that's now uh, covered by later fills. Um, this military harbor uh, was connected to a, another harbor on the north side of the uh, city uh, for which Sinop was well known in antiquity uh, as having both north and south harbors. 
Um, but these were connected together by a monumental, uh, what appears to be a monumental major road uh, and uh, very likely flanked by some kind of public space, uh, including a temple precinct um, in the general area that is uh, now uh, uh, occupied by the so-called Temple of Serapis. Um, in addition to the monumentalization of the city itself, there was also a series of fourth century peri-urban villas uh, that have been documented by the Sinope Museum uh, up the flanks, the western flanks of uh, Boztepe. And these clearly establish a district of elite residents uh, within the same time frame. And here we're looking at, um, with, uh, uh, with uh, permission, we are showing the uh, image uh, from uh, Cabo and Voral's uh, recent article uh, uh, of some of the mosaics uh, uncovered by the Sinope Museum uh, in uh, several years ago. Uh, and to the left, we can see a uh, beautiful example of the same kind of pebble, early pebble mosaics that were actually uh, underneath the so-called Serapis Temple in the museum uh, garden. Uh, that were uh, excavated by Akragal and Buddha back in the 1950s. So we have this uh, extensive district of luxury uh, villas, um, clearly the emergence of some kind of elite class uh, that is inhabiting uh, these. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, and so accompanying the emergence of the elite class, we also see the emergence of monumental burials, uh, which include uh, the, uh, the well-known uh, lion uh, and uh, deer group uh, that was excavated about five kilometers outside of the city uh, and uh, published by Ludwig Buda in 1963. Um, this, uh, this monument, uh, I believe the location is quite significant uh, as it is uh, several kilometers outside of the city a little further along the same road, uh, there are uh, clusters of tumulus uh, burials. Uh, there are also tumuli burials uh, overlooking the city uh, from, the, uh, from the site of Shahin Tepisi uh, up here uh, near the modern uh, military base in a very commanding uh, location. And then also a series of tumuli along the Show, uh, overlooking the uh, South Harbor uh, that, uh, that seemed to all be part of the monumentalization and the claiming of uh, space uh, in, uh, in the hinterland. So we see the monumentalization of the uh, promontory uh, spaces and the hinterland uh, as very much like uh, was seen in the Northern and Western Black Sea uh, in the examples that uh, Jane uh, considers. So the monumentalization of the city and these uh, near city and even further um, uh, distant uh, spaces uh, clearly needs to con be considered explicitly in the framework of an increasing urban, urban rural relationship that contributed to a substantial economic political and military efflorescence of the city. So in conclusion, um, far from being a period of fragmentation or, or decline, the late classical and early, early Hellenistic period in the Black Sea was one, uh, a period of prosperity, mobility and competition. And, uh, and, and a period in which uh, all of these factors uh, enmeshed the Black Sea regionally in uh, a common series of uh, experiences and responses. In terms of the rural hinterlands that were at the heart of our Anatolian studies paper, <clears throat> this resulted in uh, intensified connections between city and hinterland that were guaranteed by an increased in investment in agricultural specialization, uh, agricultural installations, and surplus production that, that drove um, the, uh, the expansion and uh, increased investment in the, the hinterlands. It also meant that there was greater integration of communities beyond the Kora, the traditional Kora, 
uh, with the, the uh, coastal poles themselves, and that these expanded and intensified rural hinterlands drove out lines of connection um, into the uh, broader uh, regional environment. In a broader sense, this prosperity and competition was expressed through monumentalization of landscapes. And importantly, we can place Sinope and the broader South Coast firmly within this larger Black Sea patterning. Now, we'd like to invite further discussion uh, from our distinguished uh, listeners uh, and beyond about how the model presented here may well provide insight into the process of growing econo economies across the Hellenistic greater Mediterranean. All too often, attention is focused on the great centers of power, the royal seats, and larger than life historical figures of the period. Perhaps in the end, Hellenistic prosperity was built on the strengthening of much more modest local relationships. And in, in closing, um, a, a note from uh, both of us uh, that uh, Mark Wilkins was an inspiration to all of us who practice archaeology as a transdisciplinary practice in Turkey. Basham is Salsum, Nurichin Deatsum. And we would like to thank um, the many, many stakeholders uh, that have been absolutely invaluable uh, to our uh, work in Sino, our own institutions. Uh, the uh, Ministry of Culture and Tourism uh, in, in Turkey, the Sino Belediye in Valilip, and, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, the museum. We'd like to thank our sponsors, the NEH, uh, the uh, British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara, uh, National Geographic Society, and others. Uh, and, um, and we'd like to acknowledge uh, the important uh, help of the Sino Cultural and Historical Research Foundation, Friends of Sino Kali Excavations, and so many others. And thank you for your attention. Uh, Nisha, we can't yes. hear you. Yes. Sorry, I, I had myself muted. Okay, thank you both. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Jane. That was a fantastic presentation. And it is really exciting to see some of the updates from the Anatolian Studies paper, the, um, the, the new, the results of the excavations, the harbours, the pebble mosaics. There is um, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see some people have put some um, comments already in the chat box thanking you. Um, I would encourage you all participants to write your questions, um, preferably in the Q&A box. You will find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen next to the raise hand button. So if you put them there, though, they will be the first, that's the, sorry, that will be the first place that I look um, when I read out the questions. I will try and come to questions in the chat box, but it will be, I won't necessarily spot them as questions. While I can see there's one question already um, from Denise Orojal, which we will come to, but I am going to absolutely jump in and get a question in myself. I had a number of questions from the paper, um, but I actually, the question which is really burning in my mind right now is one of the, the bigger ones inspired by what you said towards the end, which is about um, a quite a radical reconceptualization of what the Hellenistic period is, a decentralization of this whole period of history, which we see in such a, um, a traditional canonical sense and, um, and really not even drawing it down to individual cities but drawing it out of the cities and I, I love that I think that's fantastic and um, it was a question really brought out of your comments about a monumental landscape or monumentalized landscape do you think that for this period we're talking about a breaking or dissolving of this boundary between urban and rural can we speak of a suburban culture can we speak of can we do we have suburbia at this stage? Um, I'll, I'll leave that as my question. Well, I think uh, one of our goals is to um, to get that question out there. Um, I, I, I don't know that uh, that I'm confident enough <laughs> to to extend what we observe 
in our case studies uh, to, to extend that throughout the Mediterranean, although it does seem to resonate with uh, many patterns, again, across the greater Mediterranean basin, right? Um, hopefully this is the beginning of a conversation about how um, the, perhaps the most salient transformation of the age may not be the emergence of kingdoms, but the engagement of urban and not just a, a hora, which is of course an old pattern, but uh, the engagement of the beyond the hora in, in a kind of structured relationship that uh, serves to grow an economy and a, a, a life way um, for, for all, really. Um, I, I don't want to be preachy here, but, uh, but it, it is, I think, um, in some ways, maybe a, an alternative narrative of what, the, what this fourth, third century uh, efflorescence means in broader terms. Uh, Jane, you can, you can bring me down. Well, I was just thinking about the <laughs> suburban, suburban landscape um, aspect of your, your question, Nisha, which is so interesting. And Owen and I have you know, discussed various ways in which um, you know, people were circulating and interacting in this sort of newly structured um, urban rural landscape. And I think there's a lot more work and questioning that could, could, needs to be done um, on that. But um, it's, there's, there's no doubt that there are new, new, new things happening in the sort of Nearer, nearer Cora asked parts of of the of, of many many of the polis um, in the Black Sea region in in, in this period, but uh, important questions uh, remain about who owned the land, who lived in these new settlements. Uh, you know the, the 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 sort of villas with pebble mosaics and sinop are a really interesting little nut to crack here. Um, and you know I wondered whether there may be perhaps analogous to say the villa district at Olympus or something you know mm. like that but it's not quite the same but there's something interesting there to be thinking about but then then the sort of next step about you know what's happening just a bit further out from the, the urban environments I think really does bring in all sorts of important but really difficult questions about land ownership and the nature of the labor in these agricultural landscapes which you know takes the shine off the idea of it being a suburban landscape if you're thinking about you know sort of large dependent populations kind of working in these agricultural landscapes so really fascinating I, I think um, there's just more work that, that needs to be done about it yeah in in fact the the suburban landscape in the sense that I, I think you may have been um, considering is in fact something we would probably argue for the later Roman Imperial and um, uh, and and uh, following the the establishment of the of Constantinople uh, as the you know new metropolis for the Roman Empire, um, so there is sort of an example of that locally. Uh, I I don't know that it's so much the breakdown of a uh, of uh, of the urban rural divide as much as a a greater structuring of these relationships that, that entangles um, more far-flung communities. Um, and, and so one, one of the things that we're still working on is, is uh, for example, in a monumental landscape, uh, which uh, is um, locating major monuments, five, six, seven kilometers outside of the city, um, to what extent are we looking at a landscape where uh, procession and ritual is is involved in, um, in in creating familiarity in in as it were taming an outside outside of the city landscape? Um, I, I I hate to use that word because it's uh, it it is so odiously colonialist. Um, and sorry. I, Sorry, it jumped out there, but um, perhaps from the perspective of the people inside the city, that was what was going on. Uh, perhaps from people outside the city, the perspective is that you know this they they are participating in 
um, this broader community. Um, there, there's an interesting series of um, tomb monuments from Sinope, and one in particular uh, is of a man named Manes, uh, who's characterized as, a, uh, as an oil uh, merchant uh, or oil, oil uh, oil, oil seller. seller, perhaps, yeah. And, and so, um, but the name Manes is uh, a name we would not associate with the Greek community of the, the city. Um, it dates to the fourth, third century and, um, and, and is interestingly suggestive of what could be a broader pattern of, uh, of integration. And it comes to Denise's question about, um, you know, who is living in these hinterlands and certainly um, it's territory that's traditionally associated with the Paphlagonians, um, but there is, you know, some uh, epigraphic and textual evidence to suggest Paphlagonians, if not living in, interacting very closely with um, the people of Sinope. And there are even, um, uh, there's even epigraphic evidence for what are probably Paphlagonian populations living in or moving to the north coast of the Black Sea and in and the, and the Bosporan Kingdom. So, you know, we've got a lot of mobility and interaction in, in this period um, that's uh, evidenced epigraphically. In terms of what language they spoke, I'm not sure we could answer I'm that question. There. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm glad we got to Denise's question because that came in very early. So um, I'm glad we, we managed to answer and also to, to raise this question of who these, who these populations were. And you've kind of highlighted something which is this unanswered question about the power dynamics of um, is this taming a landscape? Is this a colonialist approach? Is this uh, greater integration? Is it more participation? It's, um, it's hard. But before I get carried away, I, I really have to read you some of these questions because they are now coming in thick and fast. Susan Walker says, is not the evidence is not the evidence from Bulgaria particularly valuable for relations between Greek cities and indigenous groups? For example, the inscription from Pistiros near Plovdiv. Question from John Wilkes, sorry. Yes, certainly. And um, in this sort of short pricey today, uh, focused probably for convenience sake on um, just giving some examples from the north coast of the, the Black Sea, but certainly in the paper we've incorporated um, evidence from the West Coast uh, as well. Um, and, and certainly um, both from sites like uh, Pistiras where we have this, you know, very clear epigraphic evidence for, uh, you know, Greek merchants living in, in, in some sort of semi-autonomous uh, relationship in the middle of, uh, of Thracian territory um, for clear economic political inter integration. But we can also see that in the, or versions of that in the in the hinterlands of um, sites like Kalatis and uh, and Histria and Apollonia Pontica along the coast as well. So it's very much these these same these same trends come there. And I I, I left out a lot of those examples just for for the sake of brevity um, today. So apologies to Bulgaria and the west coast and Romania as well. Uh, in in fact, uh, Nisha, your uh, that that question, and I, I'm not looking at the chat, so I can't uh, assign, uh, thank the particular person who asked it, but um, uh, per perhaps that raises a possibility that the British Institute might have interest in hosting a conference on such a, uh, 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 such a topic that, uh, that would in fact uh, yield wonderful interaction and discussion on, on topics like this. Of course, back whenever, whenever it is that we'll all see one another physically again in, in the world. Absolutely. So that, that question was from John Wilkes via Susan Walker's Zoom account. Well, John, if you are interested in that idea of hosting something or organizing something to um, bring this discussion together, maybe this is something we should uh, consider. Anyway, if this is something that interests any of you, please let's get in touch and see, see where the world takes us. More questions, though. Kathy Draycott has two questions. First one is, is some of this connectivity of smaller polities continuous? from the Achaemenid period and something which might be related to satrapal economies? That's question number one. Question number two, in case you want to take it together, is for some of the features such as irrigation and field divisions, as well as roads, 
what is the dating evidence? I have to admit that was one of the questions that I put in my notes as well. Shall I take that second one um, first, just yeah, uh, yeah. because it's it's perhaps more most straightforward. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a range of, of, of evidence of different at different um, sites and, and and regions in the best documented cases, um, as in the Kersenisen, both near Cora and far Cora, where there are um, divided field systems and uh, in the Bosporan Kingdom, uh, there are many instances of excavated uh, field divisions and, uh, and um, uh, yes, so, so essentially ground truth uh, examples of these divisions, but also combined with the uh, analysis of distributions of sites from the fourth and early third centuries BC and um, a coincidence between them uh, that um, are suggestive of the, the dating of the larger, the larger system. Also the overall cohesiveness of um, some of these gridded field systems, particularly in the Kersenesan territories in the Bosporan Kingdom also suggests a sort of single uh, uh, time of planning and implementation. Um, some of the road networks uh, are dated based on the dates of the sites that they connect. So that's particularly true for the Taman Peninsula, where you have a series of sites uh, that were established from the fourth and into the early second centuries BC and road networks that then connect these, these new sites. Um, and some of the uh, route ways are connected with or following the lines of the field system. So that the sort of dating goes hand in, in hand with those. Um, and, and some are, are, are not precisely dated. So for example, the field systems at Olbia um, are, are post sixth century and based on the sort of redevelopment of the core in the fourth century or the sort of increased, there's a decline in the fifth century and, and, a, and an increase of settlements in the fourth century. So the implication there is that those field systems relate to those fourth century sites. So a combination of, of, of dating rationale, some of which are really sort of stratigraphically robust and some of which are based on a series of logical arguments, but not, not 100% infallible, infallible. Yeah, and so uh, thanks, Jane, for leaving me the impossible question, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, uh, uh, I mean, of, of course, the, um, the, the, the Persian Empire, in many ways, is, is sort of an, uh, an, an impetus driving almost all uh, processes in Anatolia and, and Western Eurasia in these, uh, in these centuries. Um, in an interesting and challenging, um, I think, way, it's really difficult to, to understand uh, precisely what impact the, the Persian, um, the, you know, the development of the satrapal uh, structured uh, political and economic world um, had on on our area, uh, certainly in in northern Anatolia, um, because you know there aren't a lot of formal and explicit uh, sort of references to that relationship. It it is true that uh, Sinope was under pressure uh, from the um, the satrap um, Datames, for example, in the early fourth century, um, the uh, the specific uh, wording of the treaty between Sinope and Heraclea, which is dated in the three forties, um, suggests that specifically the the king is the one example of a, a foe that they would not resist. Um, so in light of the Datames invasions uh, and, and uh, machinations a generation before, I find that interesting because it, you know, it may be that, uh, that a satrap like Datames is fair game for Sinope and Heraclea to, um, uh, to sort of gang up against, um, as long as it's clear that he's not um, acting on behalf of the king. Um, 
so that, that I mean that wording is is interesting, right? Um, uh, and and so uh, in terms of economy, uh, Datames did have I, I think the effect of peeling off a an a, the eastern colonies of Sinope in the Eastern Black Sea, uh, and to some extent the the, the colonial resource economy, which, um, which sees uh, the, the city as sort of an emporium through its first several centuries, uh, seems to be reoriented uh, in, this, uh, in, in the fourth century uh, following Datame's aggressions. Uh, they, they lost their Eastern colonies, which were apparently providing uh, the, the raw materials for a metals trade in particular. Um, and, and then uh, to what extent could taxation have been driving a, um, a need for uh, intensification of production? You know, was it necessary to have more cash flow somehow uh, in order to, um, to, to survive in the world at the edge of the Persian Empire. Um, I, I, I think it's a, these are all reasonable to postulate. Uh, do we have any evidence for any of that? <laughs> I, I'm not so sure. If it comes to, around to um, the question from John Brendan Knight about the um, Sinopean colonies to the east, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Owen, but it's been suggested that um, as a result of or in conjunction with the pressure from Datames, um, Sinope lost control of those, those settlements to the east, and that might have also been a potential driving factor in reinvesting in, um, in the hinterland of, of Sinope. Um, if I've got that wrong, Owen, do correct yeah, me. But... Uh, actually, so uh, bracketing that process, um, Xenophon uh, seems to have no doubt that um, that the colonies, Kotiora and Trebizond and so forth, belong to the, the Sinop colonial system uh, in you know in 400. Datames we see 382 uh, uh, attacks Sinope on, on several occasions. Uh, he he uh, eventually uh, seems to have come to um, to dominate the city. Um, and uh, certainly there were Sinopean coins uh, that are minted with uh, under the name of Datames, uh, for example. Um, so, so we've got 400 or so uh, Xenophon uh, showing no, um, uh, no hesitation about the Sinopean assertion of authority in that sphere. 380s, we see the Tames, and 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 then um, following that, we see the expansion of a lucrative hora on Boztepe, uh, production of, uh, of some kind of crops that were going into the uh, amphoras that are then uh, becoming uh, very widely distributed around the Black Sea, but also in the hinterland. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that is how we could frame the colonial situation. And to the second part of um, John Brennan's Knight's question about the sort of what, what can we say about the rest of the, the south coast of, of the Black Sea? My, I think it's difficult. My impression is that it's maybe more variable than some of the the patterning that that we were um, presenting, it, it, it's also variable in terms of the types of data that we have to, to talk about uh, what's going on. Um, certainly, the textual records about Heraclea suggest a similar sort of period of expansion, not only in its own hinterland, perhaps even a bit earlier in the fifth century, but also along the uh, along the coast to, to the west, incorporating settlements there, and also it's associated with the foundations of um, settlements like uh, Calatis and Chersonesis. Um, so you know, definitely we've had that picture of that fits there for for Heraclea. Um, and uh, 
Um, it's also, I think, if John asked about specifically, um, there's people here who know this better, but there's much earlier evidence for um, uh, for, for, for Greek pottery moving into the hinterland um, of Amisas uh, there, so a, a different picture from, from Sinop. And surveys in the central Pontic region um, uh, have tended to show uh, uh, um, potentially a decline in settlements in the late Iron Age period, but the pottery chronologies are very difficult for that period. Interestingly, though, I think there's a fairly consistent picture of monumentalization, especially in the realm of sort of monumental burials in all of these regions. So we get um, uh, mounded in the sort of Chide region, we get new mounded burials in the Hellenistic period after a period like where they hadn't been before. Uh, well, there's the Paphlagonian rock cut tombs at Amisos, we have the uh, large monumental burials there as well. So potentially we have a, 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 a in terms of settlement, numbers, something different going on, um, and depending on what you're looking at, but a similar approach to kind of monumentalized landscapes, uh, as you can see, seen at various places. Yeah, and, and one thing that's really interesting about the monumentalized, uh, the, the tumuli uh, in particular, I mean, thinking of, for example, that the, the Hellenistic tumulus on uh, Ikis Tepe, um, and um, the attention paid to mounded uh, prehistoric settlements uh, and and the the, um, uh, the the sort of focus on uh, mounded uh, Bronze Age settlements and even Calcolithic settlements uh, as as, uh, as as places where tumuli from this period are being uh, set up is is really interesting. I mean, uh, we have uh, up well over a thousand meter elevation in um, the the site of Kyanan Basha. Uh, way up at the um, near near the watershed of the Pontic uh, Alps in, in Sinop province, we have um, a, an extremely remote location, Calcolithic site, um, and right on top of the Calcolithic site, in the middle, literally of nowhere, the place that has never been anywhere, um, a, a tumulus with deposits of uh, imported uh, black slip and other ceramics, Sinop amphoras, little Aphrodite head, um, just fascinating, right? And so this, and, and there are numerous examples that we've documented in the survey of this coincidence of uh, placing tumuli near mounded Bronze Age settlements, somehow claiming perhaps ancestry relating to a you know, the development of some kind of um, other place I've talked about, maybe some middle ground kind of conversation between communities, um, you know, es establishing sort of ancestral narratives in, in space that, um, that may reflect a kind of competition over the, you know, who gets to tell the story about our, our land. Um, which I, I think is an interesting, um, perhaps it's a digression from what we were talking about, but it's an interesting element of the of the um, uh, of the monumentalization of the landscapes. I mean, nearly every tumulus cemetery in Sinop that we've documented is near a Bronze Age mounded site, which is interesting. Um, Elif, Elif in the Q&A has asked how the dynamics changed from archaic uh, in rural places or from archaic to classical. What do we have in hand about the early Iron Age? Um, and, and so, um, so this is an interesting uh, question. Um, our, our understanding as far as we have at this point is there's very little uh, engagement between the, um, the, the, the colony uh, in Sinope and the hinterland uh, in these, um, what, we, what we would call in Greece, the archaic uh, period or even, even the early classical. Um, there is almost no uh, ceramic material <clears throat> that that's sort of spread um, into the hinterland. Um, 
coming from outside. Um, I, so I, I first of all say that there is no archaic in, in the hinterland. Um, there's a, a coincident Iron Age um, and, and uh, settling that chronology, uh, I, I, think, I think we're going to have to wait um, uh, for a lot more um, extensive research to, to settle that chronology because the, the ceramics are very conservative um, and uh, relatively simple in forms. Um, actually, once you get up to the uh, uh, up to the the southern side of the southern face of the Pontic Alps, looking down towards Anatolia, then we see datable Iron Age painted wares. You know the sorts of things you might see at you know, uh, Alashar or Boiscre, these other, you know, all these other sites. Um, even, um, even the connections with nearby um, Oymaj or Merik are, are, are really limited in, uh, in, in the Sino promontory, um, even, even for relatively uh, close uh, settlements. So, so I don't think we have any archaic, quote unquote, uh, in the sense that there's, uh, even even in comparison to Samsun and um, and, and the Akalan Kale, for example, which I, I I suppose if if you want to call that archaic, you can, since there's those little you know there's some material that you could connect with a with Greek related origins or Greek related you know uh, material culture. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't really seem to have um, that, even that level of engagement uh, in Sino Promontory. Fantastic. We are busting through the questions and they do seem to follow seamlessly from one to the other, tying in earlier periods, but this seemingly pretty radical reconfiguration or reimagining of, of networks and connections, even if those networks and connections are older, they are certainly being repurposed around this period, it seems. Um, Kathy has a follow-up question, an extension question. Would the field divisions in the later fourth century imply a new, smaller farm organization as opposed to a vaster pastoral agricultural system in the hand of a larger, in the hands of larger landlords earlier? Speculating, of course, is there evidence for a change in diet? Yeah, um, again, this comes back to the, the very difficult question about land ownership and, you know, who, who, who owned the land, who was living on the land, who was working the land and, and what their sort of statuses and relationships uh, were. And um, I think this is where some of the local variability comes into play. It's difficult to give a single answer. I think it is possible that in some cases where we seem to have um, uh, more uh, intimate field systems close to closer to um, a, a polis uh, developing or being reinvigorated. So say I'm thinking of uh, Nymphaeon uh, in the Karach Peninsula or the Japan Peninsula more generally, or maybe even Kalachis. It's possible that here we have um, a formalization of land ownership in a, in a way that is meant to relate to Oikos level production. Um, on the other hand, the, the best evidence from field systems um, comes from places where there's, it's clear that the, these, these field systems are being put to use for surplus production. So, um, you know, if a, a regular um, sized land uh, field or set sort of oikos allotment of land um, for sustainability in the Aegean region is around five hectares. The field plots at Kersinesis are 26 hectares. They're, you know, these are big field systems. We have a comparable sort of size of field systems in the um, Kerch Peninsula of the, of the Bosporan Kingdom. These are the two most obvious places where we have sort of claiming of new territory for agricultural purposes with these big gridded field systems. Um, in Kersinesis in the near Kora, um, I think it's been estimated that um, based on evidence for planting within these large land plots that 50%, up to 50% of the, the, the agricultural land in the, fifth, in the fourth century was put to vine for wine production. So this is, you know, significant 
uh, investment in, in, in sort of surplus agricultural production. So I don't think the, the interpretation that we're seeing a move towards um, smaller scale land ownership or, or production holds in general. Um, I don't think we see evidence for a shift from pastoral to agricultural practices in, in the fourth century, uh, particularly either. Um, but for the north coast of the Black Sea, uh, paleobotanical, paleo, um, archaeobotanical evidence suggests that um, towards the end of the fourth century, around 300, there was a shift to um, growing uh, rye or including rye within a three fallow system. So this doesn't speak to diet particularly. It, does, it potentially suggests changing climatic factors or a, a, a sort of new and or a new pattern of um, fallow uh, and, and crop rotation that would uh, enable the most robust product from from that from that landscape. I think I may have talked around your question, but that's sort of what comes to, to mind. And, and I would just add in in Sinope, we are at far too an, too early a stage in the investigation to to contribute meaningfully to the discussion on diet, certainly. Um, and uh, the rather patchy uh, nature of the evidence on Bose Tepe, um, I, I would say it would be consistent with um, a couple hundred meters between uh, Hellenistic uh, stone structures we interpret as farmsteads. Um, uh, so that, uh, you know, I, I would say something on the order of the 20 to 30 hectare uh, plots uh, is is likely up on the on the slopes of uh, Boz Tepe. I think the villas with the beautiful mosaics down near town are a different thing. I don't I don't think at this point we're looking at a Villa Rustica kind of thing um, at the edge of town. I, I think this is an elite residential um, sort of district that um, there are, uh, the, the Sinope Museum excavated a, um, a, a, a an impressive um, uh, candidate for a, a major Villa Rustica with, uh, with the whole pithos field and, um, uh, and uh, you know, very, um, I, I think, uh, extensive uh, capacity for storage that would also be consistent with an interpretation of a, a fairly large scale operation. Um, although I, I don't think I'm at liberty to speak too much about the details at this point at least. Well, it's great just to have a taste. Um, I know that we are getting close to our finishing time. I do not want to keep people any longer, but I just wonder on that point about scales of production, um, do we know much about the amphorae, the amphora stamps? Is there anything that we got about the amphora stamps about different producers or standardization of this? Um, in what sense? So, what's something that's always intriguing. This is um, parallel to what you were just asking about, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the things that's always intrigued me is the um, sheer amount and dominance of not just, you know, uh, Sinopean amphorae, but also roof tiles um, in various parts of the Black Sea, particularly in the sort of later fourth, early third centuries BC. And there's a period, um, I think it's, I think it's the sort of last quarter of the fourth century, or maybe the very beginning of the third century in, in the Obia region, where there are only Sinopean roof tiles. Uh, so you, however they're getting there, whatever sort of uh, mechanism of, of exchange, it's, it's flooding out any other roof tile option in that uh, in that kind of area, but I have a feeling you're talking more about sort of within Sinope and what we can say about the Emperor stamp. So I'll leave that to to Owen. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I to some extent, it's clear that the um, that it's exactly within this time frame, the the late fourth, early and early to middle third century, that uh, there is a very uh, well-organized uh, sort of bureaucracy uh, represented by the uh, by the stamped amphora um, uh, data. Um, 
I, I, I don't know to, to what extent that might uh, be connected to a sort of centralized kind of in, industrial approach. Um, it, I, I, I just think it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's difficulty, it's difficult to make a leap uh, be, between those. I mean, it, it, there may be something there. I, I, I don't know that anybody can really say what that link is. Do you, do you have an idea or, or would you like to follow up? Um, oh, no, no, just I know that there are some people who are fantastic at looking at um, standardization and for stamps and extrapolating from that. Um, I think the studies are yeah. and for, so I just wondered if there was something, but I am very conscious of the time. So I am now I'm afraid going to sadly close the discussion. I'm very sorry, um, Yuming Tang, who has written a question on the question and answer box, and um, please email me, Yuming. I'm sorry we didn't get round to this. Anybody else who has missed a question, I'm very sorry. You guys are simply too popular. There is too much to say about your paper. Um, we are sticking um, with the theme of landscapes and trying to radically reinterpret landscapes for our next seminar, which is happening on the 30th of March. Um, we'll be looking at, uh, at um, I can't quite remember the exact title, but it is Landscapes in the Milesian Cora um, with Anya Slavish and Toby Wilkinson. So we're looking forward to that. I hope you can join us. Um, there our are mother city, yes. I hope. Our, yes, our mother city at Sinope. It's there we go, see the connection. And everybody else. Oh, it's yes. perfect. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Um, there's information about this um, and again about uh, memberships please come and join our club in the chat box. Um, unfortunately, the chat box is, box is about to disappear because I'm going to shut the webinar down. Um, I'm afraid you all, you probably all have much better things to do, but I have really enjoyed the last hour and a half. It's been fantastic. So thank you, all of you who've made it through to the end. My apologies again for the slow start. That was entirely my fault, not managing to work technology again. Um, and thank you to Jane and thank you to Owen. Yeah, Shamla, everybody. Good evening. Shamla, thank you. Thanks for the questions.